What's going on YouTube? It is Tuesday morning, which means week one of the NFL season is officially in the books. I'm exhausted right now, mainly because I had to stay up to watch that 49ers Rams game because I was in a big matchup and I was going against Hyde and Tavon Austin. Having to stay up and root against players for fantasy purposes is like the most un-American thing ever. Came away with the victory, baby, which means I'm in a good mood. E-Town get down, round eight. I am one and zero. Oh. That's huge. Isn't it funny how like a win in fantasy can dictate the next day following that victory? I know I'm pumped up about it. Hope you guys came away with some victories based on some of the advice that I gave you. Probably took more losses on it, if I had to guess. But I want to recap, run through each game, and just take small takeaways, probably one from each team, as we move forward to week two. Do recaps at the end. I'll throw in um, top pickups of the week, top defenses to stream for next week. First up, we have Green Bay and the Jacksonville Jaguars. First takeaway, Eddie Lacy is still fat. Next takeaway, I can't trust any of these wide receivers as anything more than a wide receiver too. Uh, Jordy, Devontae, Randall Cobb. Can't believe Devontae Adams is back here making some noise, but he had a great catch in the end zone for a tutty. Um, Jordy Nelson also got in for a touchdown, but he only went six for 32. Devontae was, you know, he put up 50 yards. Same thing with Randall Cobb, 55 yards, I think it was. Um, Rodgers looked great, obviously. He's going to have better games than that, but I think the way this offense is flowing, you know, the ball's going to be going each and every way. So I'm not really comfortable starting any of these guys as anything more than a wide receiver, too. Uh, Cobb and Adams are probably, well, Cobb is probably more in the wide receiver three discussion. Adams is, I'm not, I won't start him obviously unless he goes on a little hot streak here. I guess you could pick him up if you need some depth at wide receiver. Jacksonville, Julius Thomas and A. Rob are going to absolutely eat this year. Uh, we saw Julius Thomas grab all five of his targets for 64 yards and a touchdown. He's clearly gonna be heavily involved in this offense and I think he's gonna wind up as a top eight tight end. Uh, throughout the year, if he could stay healthy, they use him in the red zone, they use him on deep balls, outside, all this good stuff. So, Julius Thomas definitely moving up on my board. A-Rob, uh, from a stat line point of view, 6 or 72, easily, you know, he was 2 or 3 inches away from having a 9 for 150, one touchdown stat line. Bunch of balls, hit his fingertips, you know, he had tons of red zone targets. Sam Shields played him fantastic, so I think, uh, I think... He had 15 targets, so it's only it's only going up from here. I'm glad I took a Rob uh, in a couple of my leagues. Next up, we have Buffalo at Baltimore. I am so sorry if any of you guys had to go to this game. Um, the this is had to be the worst game of the of week one. 13 to seven, Baltimore pulls off a victory, uh, and I think the theme throughout this game, which we should take going forward is that it's going to be hard to trust anyone on either of these teams. So Tyrod Terrible, I almost just called him Tyrod Terrible, should be his nickname. Tyrod Taylor threw for 111 yards. Um, so that's, <clears throat> that's a problem. You don't want that in fantasy. That's, uh, he was someone I was super high on coming in and uh, Buffalo just seems to not want to run their offense through him. Rex Ryan still, I guess, doesn't trust him. Uh, they're not taking any deep shots. And that's probably because Sammy Watkins and his fucking foot. The last month and a half, all you heard was reports of how Sammy Watkins was 100% healthy. He looked great at practice. He looked great in training camp. Like 18 seconds before kickoff, Adam Schefter, Sammy Watkins is less than 100%. His foot is getting tired. I'm like, bro, are you fucking kidding me? He's my third round pick on him in my big league. So I'm pissed about it, obviously. But... What are you gonna do? Um, he says there's no pain in the foot. Other reports have came out saying that, you know, I don't know why I would look at other reports when he's the one saying it, but you know, clearly he's saying one thing during training camp and now it's a different thing, so it's hard to trust anyone here. 
Either way, they have a very short week. They're playing on Thursday Night Football against the Jets. It's going to be super, super hard to trust anyone on this team, including Watkins. I am not. I'm, I'm going to monitor the reports throughout the week and see how he progresses. But barring me, you know, having having to play him as like my wide receiver three, I'm I'm not looking towards him in my starting lineup because I just don't trust him right now. It's going to be one of the lowest scoring games in the in week two. The over under is 40 and a half, which is the lowest of the week two NFL season. Let's move to Baltimore, uh, where we actually saw a decently productive game out of Joe Flacco. Uh, he's one of my top streamers for next week. If you had Tyrod, you could drop his ass for Flacco. They get to go to Cleveland, where we saw Carson Wentz light them up. Um, Cleveland's obviously a shit show over there, but Flacco's a nice streamer. Uh, I can't trust any of the wide receivers. The targets were dispersed everywhere. Steve Smith had nine targets, caught like two of them. Mike Wallace had the deep ball, obviously, broken coverage. You know, that shit's not going to happen all the time. Can't trust wide receivers. Dennis Pitta, can't trust tight end. Forsett and Terrence West had almost identical um, touch counts. I think it was 15 to 14 in favor, or 14 13 in favor of Terrence West. Justin Forsett did outsnap him 37 to 27 and was way more effective in the touches that he had. So he's still the play there. He's not a play. Please don't play him. But if you were, you know, if someone put a fucking gun to your head and was like, pick a fucking Baltimore running back right now, I'd be like, shit. I don't know why you're freaking out about a Baltimore running back, but I'll take Justin Forsett. Houston and Chicago. We saw the theme of the workhorse running back. Clearly, Lamar Miller and Jeremy Langford are the guys there. Not a lot of questions in the preseason, but it's nice to see that it's confirmed. Langford a lot less efficient with his touches, uh, but he did get his goal line touch, and he got in there for one-yard touchdown, which saved fantasy owners. Um, he got 19 of a possible 22 running back touches, including receptions. So he's, you know, he's a clear number one there and it looks like he's going to get 75 to 80% of the touches in that offense, which is good going forward. Of course, the team sucks, but he's good. On the other side of the ball, we have Lamar Miller who saw 32 touches. Jesus Christ. I guess we knew it was coming, but it's just shocking to see. Texans are probably going to have to reel that, that back a little bit. Like you want to, uh, people want to know why Arian Foster gets hurt every 16 minutes because the Texans gave him 55 touches a game. Why do you think the MLB teams use a pitch count on pitchers that they like because they don't want their fucking elbow falling off in three years? That's the same shit that's going to happen with Miller. You can't sustain 32 touches a game and expect them to be efficient. And honestly, he wasn't that efficient in this game. But, you know, that bodes well, obviously. He's clear cut RB1. You don't get guys that get 32 touches a game. So I'm happy there. Uh, second biggest takeaway is clearly Will Fuller. Huge pickup this week. One of the top waiver wire pickups. He saw 11 targets, turned that into 108 yards and a touchdown. Should have had a much, much bigger game, but he dropped uh, a big ball that would have, you know, blew the roof off the defense and uh, he would have been one of the top scorers as wide receivers here this week in fantasy. He is the clear cut number two option there behind D-Hop. Uh, he is the deep threat in that offense, and they have a quarterback in Brock Eisweiler who is not afraid to slime that thing. So, uh, Will Fuller, you know, I, I like his prospects going forward. Props to you, Nicol Nicholas Isidori, for taking him in the eighth. Next up, we have the shit show that was the Cleveland Browns. Carson Wentz, 22 of 37, 278 yards, something around there. Two touchdowns. Uh, my biggest takeaway here is that I don't have a takeaway because I will absolutely not base my week one opinion on them playing well against the Cleveland Browns. Like it's simple as that, you know, you can't form a, a, a season long opinion on one week, especially against a shitty, 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 shitty team. And that's what the Cleveland Browns are. So, um, I'm not picking up Wentz on any of my teams. Um, Ryan Matthews is good to see the 22 carries, but the other backs were super involved in the passing game. I'm honestly a little nervous as a Matthews owner just because this script played out perfectly for him, and it wasn't like a huge game for him. There's, there's, he's not going to get a lot of matchups and game scripts that are anywhere close to as nice as that one was. Uh, so I, I see him as more of a low-end RB2. I could see him putting up like 16 carries for 64 yards and zero touchdowns next week, you know. So uh, so I'm, I'm a little nervous about that. 
but overall, yeah, I mean, Jordan Matthews, you know, you could, they get Chicago next week, so it's another easy matchup. Um, I, I'd play Matthews as a wide receiver two, probably more so. I'd rather have him as a wide receiver three, obviously, uh, but he's like one person I'm semi, semi comfortable with playing after this showing because he's, he's a clear favorite of, of Wentz, and Zach Ertz is going to be week to week with his rib injury, so you're going to have to you know, share the targets elsewhere in that offense. And then we have Cleveland, who we saw RG3 go down like an idiot and took a hit at the end of the game. He is on the IR. He's going to be out at least until week 10, and reports say that it's going to be difficult for him to even come back at all for the season, which means Josh McCown is back in at quarterback, which actually bodes super well for the rest of, not super well, because, you know, nothing in Cleveland is ever super well, but bodes better for the weapons there in Cleveland because RG3 is, is not a good quarterback. He's not accuracy. Yes, he takes the deep ball and you'll see his ass on the sports center dun -dun 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 top 10 multiple times a year, but for an efficiency standpoint, nah. For those of you that are freaking out about Gary Barnage, don't anymore. Hold on to him for at least like two more weeks because his splits when he's playing with Josh McCowan are like godly compared to when he's not playing with him. He's McCown's favorite target, bar none. So I think Barnage is in for a very big bounce back next week. So don't, so do not get rid of Barnage just yet. Next up, my Dirty Birds against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. First up, the split at running back between Coleman and Freeman. They preached it all off season, they stuck to their word, and my God. This is not good for Devonta Freeman lovers. The splits went like this. The snap count split, Freeman 36, Coleman 32. Touches, Freeman 15, Coleman 13. The scary part was Coleman turned those 13 touches into 117 yards. Freeman turned his 15 touches into 40 yards. I'm not going to go crazy over this. I still think Freeman is a way, way better runner. I think he's way more athletic. You know, it's a tough situation right now for Freeman owners. You got to hold on to him. I mean, if someone's willing to buy high, if you can get a dollar on the dollar for Freeman right now, do that. Because right now, you can't look at him as anything more than a low-end RB2. And Coleman is probably an RB3 at the moment. Uh, you know, I the part of the game where you assume Freeman would dominate was the passing work. But Coleman caught five balls for 90 yards and he looked like a big time playmaker still a very stiff upright runner like you need to get him in space away from tacklers because he cannot make guys miss to save his fucking mother but he looked good yesterday backfield is just going to be murky for for a long time until we see someone emerge as the rp1 there and then on tampa bay side of the ball james winston is legit um we saw him throw for four touchdowns and if you think back to last year, week one, he was god-awful. Mariota was perfect passing rating. And everyone was like, oh, I knew that they should have taken Mariota. Well, you all are idiots because Jameis Winston is clearly the better passer and he's better franchise quarterback. Doesn't matter for fantasy purposes. But this is definitely a step towards a huge breakout season for Winston. I mean, I'm not going to go plug him into my lineup next week as they play against Arizona, but it's definitely very, 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 very good to see if you have him in Dynasty or, or second quarterback or something like that. So he looked phenomenal. And he was actually the number one fantasy quarterback this week in terms of points per drop back as per pro P PFF. Pro Football Focus. Again, this is another instance of I'm, I'm a Falcons fan, so I knew that the Falcons defense is fucking terrible. They're going to end up with a top five pick in the NFL draft this year. I'm not going to go nuts over this offense just yet because I know the Falcons are not good and you should not either. So next up we have the Vikings and the Titans. The Vikings were my number one pick as to a streaming defense paid off heavily. Anyways, I think the theme of this game was the number one wide receiver on each team clear cut. For the Titans, we have Tajay Sharp, 7 for 76 on 11 targets. Clearly the number one target there for Marcus Mariota. He likes the guy a lot. The dude is super athletic, makes big plays, and he should be a centerpiece of that offense going forward. And then you have Stefan Diggs on the other side of the ball, who reeled in seven catches for 103 yards on nine targets. Um, which crazy is like, 
last year, Stefan Diggs obviously had that like breakout four week period where he looked amazing and he looked like he was going to be like a solidified wide receiver too. And then he cooled off like tremendously. And, you know, he was super inconsistent. I was like, eh, I don't know about him coming into this year. I didn't think that he would, you know, he has the build to really be a wide receiver one, but every single like expert or podcast or article that I read about wide receiver breakouts this year had Stefan Diggs there. And they were like, yeah, the more I read and the more I listened about it, everyone was on him this year as like a top breakout guy. And you know, that made me obviously think about it more and more because he has no competition behind him. So I was like, hey, yeah, you know what? I'm getting a little higher and higher and higher on Diggs. So uh, if you got a, a piece of Diggs on your team, good stuff. I actually think that you could use some use some sell high candidates to go get Stefan Diggs. I think he's going to be like a, a huge piece of that offense for the rest of the year, and I think he could put up some crazy ass numbers for that offense. Um, so yeah, those are the clear cut number one guys. If for some crazy ass reason they're on any of your waiver wires, go snag them. Then we have AP. I know a lot of you guys are concerned if you took AP early, 19 rushes, 31 yards. It's Adrian Peterson, commie titties. Same thing happened week one last year. 10 rushes, 31 yards. Or am I saying these stats were right? No, I'm right. 19 rushes, 31 yards. Week one this year, 10 rushes, 31 yards. Week one last year, you're going to be fine. Relax. Don't sell him for fucking Zach Ertz. You're going to be all right. Cincinnati, New York Jets. Good game on our hands. A lot of my friends went to this game. I was super jelly. Doesn't matter. Cincinnati, we saw A.J. Green. What I tell y'all motherfuckers, he should have been the number four pick in your drafts. If he wasn't, I'm pissed I didn't get him at eight. He went at six in mine. Absolutely torched the Rel Rebus yesterday. So, uh, I mean, Rebus Island is no longer Rebus Island. It's uh, Rebus Resort now, and a lot of players are buying property on the resort. Don't be scared of this matchup going forward. If your guy's playing against Rebus... It ain't even a thing no more. AJ Green's the man. Uh, big takeaway for me was Brandon LaFell came away as a clear number two. Caught all four of his targets for 94 yards. And as long as there is a lack of passing game options, he'll continue to, you know, make big plays or have the opportunity to make these plays. So Brandon LaFell, if you need wide receiver help, definitely look his way. Uh, as for Gio and Jeremy, neither of them had... Big games, you know, better games will come. The New York Jets defense was in the backfield. They lived in the backfield uh, during this game. So apart from Hill's 12-yard touchdown run, neither of them had productive games. They get to play the Steelers next week, which, you know, has an over-under of, I think, 48 right now, which is one of the higher ones. So that should be a high-scoring game. I think both of them have decent back bounce-back games, especially Geo next week. So I'd be pumped about that. For the Jets, Fitzpatrick left off exactly where he, you know, Murray picked up exactly, if so facto, he picked up exactly where he left off last season, throwing that pick to end the game. He didn't look great, but for fantasy purposes, he's fine. He still has Marshall and Decker. Now this guy emerged out of nowhere, taking all my goddamn Marshall targets and yards and stuff. Um, I don't even know his name. I don't know how to say it. I don't, really don't have time. I don't feel like figuring out how to say it. It's like Inua. It's like E-N-U-W-O-A-U. Was that? Five O's or two U's? It's actually one U. Yeah, bullshit. If I'm a B Marsh owner, I'm not worried at all. It's the lowest fantasy point total and that he put up since week three of 2014. Just take that in for a second. So he's going to be fine. He was targeted. There was a drive where they targeted him multiple times in the end zone. He just, uh, you know, he couldn't come up with it. It was good defense. Whatever it is, those targets will continue to come. He'll be, he'll bounce back. He'll be fine. He dropped a big ball on the last drive as well, which is kind of fucking annoying as a Marshall owner, but... <clears throat> It happens. He'll bounce back. Decker, I'm a little more scared of if this dude, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, is legit. If he keeps seeing seven, eight targets a game, that's easily going to eat into Decker's, you know, target total as well. Um, but another big takeaway is definitely the fact that Forte outtouched uh, Blah Powell so heavily. Forte got 27 touches, 22 rushes, five receptions, compared to Powell's um, six, six touches. So it looks like Forte is going to be the clear workhorse going forward. He looked great in the passing game. He looked good as a runner as well. Um, I'm, I'm real pumped up. I got him as, I actually got him as my RB2 behind Langford in round six. Uh, so I'm ecstatic about that going forward. He's going to be used heavily. I do expect that things will sway a little bit more to the middle uh, as, in terms of 27 to 6 touch ratio. 
I would say maybe more so like 20 to 11 in that range. But either way, I'll, I'll take a dude that will get the ball 20 times a game in an offense that, you know, give or take, they score a pretty good amount of points. Raiders, Saints, what a damn game. Easily the game of week one. Jack Del Rio, the god. I don't know if you guys <laughs> saw that tweet, but ESPN was like, oh, the win probability if they went for an extra point at the end of the game was 51%. If they went for two, it was 44%. And Jack Del Rio, the actual coach, tweeted him back saying, good thing ESPN doesn't coach the Raiders. And I was like, that's hilarious, dude, you're a beast. Congrats on that one. Derek Carr looked good. Amari Cooper looked amazing. Clearly number one option there. I am psyched up that I got him as my wide receiver three in multiple drafts. Now, uh, Crabtree looked good too. What's interesting to note there is the running back situation. Now, Latavius Murray took most of the carries, but he also lost goal line carries. Uh, we saw Anuuli. Ah, dude, what's going on with all these goddamn crazy ass names? He was, you know, jacked by Alawali. That's his name. One yard touchdown run or two yard touchdown, vultured. And then we saw. Jalen Richard, I believe is how you pronounce it, bust off the 75 yard touchdown run in, you know, in the later half of the game. Richard is actually a dude that looked amazing in the preseason. Uh, I didn't actually think he'd get enough opportunities to show how good he could be. And clear, turns out he didn't need that many opportunities to bust out a huge run. Uh, and, and I'd definitely be nervous as a Murray owner because you don't want to see your goal line carries get taken away. And you also don't want to see other guys bust out 75 yard runs because that's, Parts of your game that you need if you're going to be an effective fantasy running back. I mean, don't get me wrong. Latavius played well. He rushed well, 4.2 yards per carry. He got in the end zone. He even caught a ball or two. So I'm I'm not freaking out or anything. I just don't think he has that RB1 appeal that he did last year. On the other side of the ball, we had Drew Brees absolutely slanging the thing. Threw for four tutties, over 400 yards. I told you all Brees was your guy this offseason, man. Got him in my 10th round. What a ridiculous pick for me. Um, so we saw Brandon Cooks and Willie Sneed absolutely go off. We saw Michael Thomas even have a nice day. I mean, everyone should have a nice day when your quarterback goes for 420 yards and four touchdowns. Unless your name is Kobe Fleener, obviously, who reeled in one ball for six yards. He was someone I was not high at all on coming into this preseason. Uh, the, all the reports said he, them two were not like on the same page. He was not learning the offense well. He was not doing well. I don't know why people would continue to pick him and just assume it didn't matter and he was just going to score touchdowns and catch shit. He's off my radar as... <clears throat> Excuse me. He's off my radar as a tight end. He will not be starting in any of my leagues for me. I don't own him in any of my leagues, so it's not a problem for me, but I'm sure it's a problem for a lot of you guys. Um, now, what did kind of make me nervous was Mark Ingram uh, in terms of the pass catching game. He only saw two targets, and he turned those into 29 yards, which is which is nice, obviously. But Traveris Cadet saw seven targets, and uh, I know a lot of people thought Spiller was going to be the pass catching back because people were like, "Oh my God, he played in Week Three. He's back. That's it. Ingram's gone. Spiller's the man now." Because Spiller took four carries in Week Three of the preseason. It's over. It's like, no, shut your mouth. The Saints were clearly trying to up his trade value because he was a healthy inactive during week one. So he has no part on this team right now. Clearly they don't see anything from Spiller. Uh, but Ingram, on the other hand, he's, he got, I think, 15 touches. 14 touches. He'll have better days. Uh, it, that passing attack was just working so so well that they didn't want to uh they didn't want to go away from it and they didn't really have a lot of goal line opportunities and the ones they did they thought it'd be better to give it to breeze at the time because the dude was rolling so don't don't uh don't give up on ingram i, I still think he's a low on rb1 in that high powered offense he'll be fine going forward as for willie sneed he's a guy i was not high on man he's a guy that's like he's a smaller guy he's fast he's quick i just didn't think that he had like more potential than he, you know, than he showed last year. He almost hit a thousand yards. Yesterday, he put up a hundred and over 170 yards through the air, and I'm like, God damn, maybe this guy's legit. Um, then again, I do want to slow the roll because they're playing the right. Not a good pass defense. They were in the dome. Drew Brees's stats inside the dome and outside the dome are like they're almost night and day which is kind of crazy considering how good of a quarterback he just is overall, but he's way better when they're playing in the Dome in New Orleans as compared to outside. So I think all those numbers were inflated. Great week one start. Definitely, you know, Willie Sneed is, is looking like a, 
a really nice compliment to Brandon Cooks. So I think both of them could be, I, I obviously I'd say Brandon Cooks is, is a low end wide receiver one, high end wide receiver two, and then flip that for Snead, probably a, a mid to low end wide receiver two, high end wide receiver three. So, cause he'll have his games where he doesn't really make an impact and Cooks will get eight to 10 targets regardless of the game. Next up we have San Diego and Kansas City choice. Obviously the big news out of here is Keenan Allen. Tore the ACL out for the season. I think this gives, it doesn't give really a boost to a lot of players because the offense as a whole is going to be hurting. Uh, Phillip Rivers, obviously, I don't even think he's startable anymore. He's the, the splits between when Keenan Allen is in and when Keenan Allen is out. He goes from, I think, all in the games that he was quarterback last year while Keenan Allen was in, he was fantasy quarterback number three. And in the games that he was out, he dropped down to double digits, like 13, 14. So, you know, that that's a huge hit for him. I think this does help Antonio Gates. I think it helps Danny Woodhead. And I think it gives a boost to Travis Benjamin. Now we'll see Benjamin uh, get some more play over the middle. And then there's Tyrell Williams, who's also kind of like a deep threat guy, who, who I wouldn't suggest in anything but like deeper, deeper leagues. Um, another, you know, another weird takeaway from this game that that would make me super nervous as a Melvin Gordon owner is the fact that Woodhead completely outplayed him in terms of volume. Now, Gordon, you know, he, he came away with those two touchdowns. He, he was looking real good on the ground. And you're like, word, like they were up 20, 21 to 3, 27. You know, they were up huge. And you're like, the game script literally can't get any better for San Diego and for Melvin Gordon. You, you got to think in your head, Melvin Gordon's about to absolutely, you know, get 20, 25 carries this game because they're up. It's, it's brown and pound. Let's kill the time. Didn't happen. Danny Woodhead end up with 50 snaps. Melvin Gordon finished with 23. Now, if that's not like the most alarming number you've ever heard as a Melvin Gordon owner, you need to turn your volume up because you probably didn't hear me. My takeaway here is Woodhead. Woodhead set a career high in carries with 16. He got in the end zone as per usual. He's going to play a huge part in this offense. If if uh, if you're playing in any sort of PPR league, I think Woodhead gives you real RB2 value with upside to have a lot of RB1 type weeks. And I'm super high on him. And I might go I might go out and try to trade for him right now. To be honest with you, uh, he looks super good. And you know, Melvin's not going to see a game script like that again. This team is not. This team is not good. Their defense blew the game last night. They barely scored after Keenan Allen went down. They're going to have a tough time moving the chains. So Woodhead should see plenty, plenty, plenty of opportunity. On the Chiefs side of the ball, Spencer Ware absolutely blew the fuck up. Out-touched Sharkandrick West a million to zero. No, I'm kidding. West had some, some passing work. Uh, but, I mean, Ware went for over 190, 199 total yards, I believe, got in the end zone. And he should be the workhorse going forward. I don't care if... Jamal Charles comes back week two, week three. It's where it's, you know, cemented himself as as uh, as the real deal there. I think um, I think this is even better now because the Chiefs, you know, they're probably going to feel like we don't need to rush them all back. Let's sit him as long as as we need to, as long as we can, because we have this guy Ware, who's a fucking savage. That's probably literally what they said in the front office. They're like, this dude's a savage. We need him on the field. Jeremy Macklin did his thing. Travis Kelsey did his thing. Alex Smith even decided to fuck around and put up over 200 passing yards, which is good for him. I actually had him starting in one really deep league, which is kind of crazy. But Dolphins, Seahawks. Big news here. Russell Wilson's ankle injury. Um, the Seahawks seem adamant on saying it's not serious. It looked kind of serious. He was clearly phased at the end of the game. Uh, so you're going to have to monitor what you see there. Uh, throughout the week if if you need to get a backup for Russell Wilson because I don't know that's going to hit every wide receiver there and that entire offense as a whole. Uh, Christine Michael out touched Thomas Rawls. He looked good. Thomas Rawls looked good as well. That's probably going to be a 50-50 split going forward for the time being. Uh, it's clear that, that the Seahawks coaches trust Rawls. That's why they kept putting him back out there. Um, I mean both runners ran well. I think Michael a little more effective in terms of yards per carry and that kind of thing, but I think they can both be trusted. I don't know if I could actually play either of them. The, uh, for Rawls owner, I'd probably be happy just because like I, I personally thought he wouldn't get more than like six to eight touches, maybe not even that, and he got more than that. So 
going forward as possible. Rawls can have, you know, if next game Rawls gets 14 carries, goes over 100 yards and a touchdown, it wouldn't surprise me if next week, you know, he's the starter and the bell cow there. Um, on the Miami side of the ball, Kenny Stills did his best Ted Ginn impression and dropped a 75 yard or 50 yard, whatever it was, bomb from Tannehill. Sure, fire touchdown. He was like 20 yards behind the defense. If so, fact though, cost them the game. Not at the time, but looking back on it, would have been a huge play. But not a lot of takeaway here for me, to be honest with you. Can't trust Tannehill. Jarvis Landry only in PPR. The offense not great. Foster uh, wasn't great aside from a 50-yard reception. Then again, they're playing the Seahawks, so that's a tough first game, especially in Seattle. So uh, I'm feeling good about Foster if I own him. He's clearly the guy there. So. You know, he's looking good. Detroit and Indianapolis. To be honest with you, I think my biggest takeaway is that you can play every f person on your team against the Colts every single week. Their defense is horrible, like awful. And then they lost more, they lost more of their, um, their top cornerbacks this week. Every time you looked, someone else was down. They're literally going to be taking dudes up. They're going to, like, I wouldn't be surprised if after this video I got a call to go play cornerback for them. Probably play better than they played yesterday. So, you're going to play everyone against them. As you saw, Detroit had no problem blowing them up. Um, Matt Safford went off. Four tutties. And, you know, it, it's clear that they're going to stick with that kind of dink and dunk game. Theo Riddick and Amir Abdullah both looked fantastic. It's it's hard, you know, they're actually both pretty good plays in PPR. Abdullah got in the end zone on a passing play only when Riddick went out. But I actually think Riddick has more value than Abdullah in PPR leagues because they use him so heavily. Um, and on the Indy side of the ball, I think that, I mean, the offense is going to put up so many points just based on the fact that defenses are going to score so much against them. So, I mean, every receiver there is a big play. You got T.Y., you got Philip Dorsett, you had Moncrief, who all played well. You got my boy, Dwayne Allen, who got in the end zone. And Jack Doyle. Love me some Jack Doyle, right? No. He had two tutties. I'm pretty sure one of them was meant for Moncrief, who was standing behind him, but he jumped up like a madman, snagged that out of the air. Um, Andrew Luck looked good. You know, the, the key takeaway there is just that you're going to be able to play all those dudes on that team and anyone playing against them. Oh, also something I didn't touch on the Saints game. Delvin, don't know how to pronounce his name. It's like B-R-E-A-U-O-X. Yeah, there's like four vowels in a row. That's definitely wrong, but Delvin Brah. That's what I'm talking about. He fractured his, or he broke his tibula or something. He was their only good player on defense. This guy was like actually like a shadow coverage cornerback who like was capable of shutting down star wide receivers. Now he's out. Now you're playing all your players against the Saints. So the Saints and the Colts are defenses that you're going to be looking to attack. If you ever need to break a tiebreaker and you're like, oh, he's going against the Saints, say no more, put him in your lineup. Next we have the Giants-Cowboys where we saw Zeke have his debut. Not efficient, didn't look good. Um, I think the Giants defense is actually pretty good and maybe that's why. He rushed 20 times for 50 yards. He did get it in the end zone on a really nice, I think it was like a 10 yard scamper or something like that. Um, but we saw Dez catch one ball for eight yards. You know, I, I think people maybe valued him a little too high. I think people were like, oh my God, Dak Prescott did well in a preseason game. He's a Hall of Famer automatically. Like, calm your fucking roll. People take experience for granted, like, whoa, to a whole new level. So I think Dez's value definitely takes a hit. I mean, he did drop a touchdown that would have changed the outlook and would have changed how you're seeing him now. I would buy I would buy him if I could. If I can buy him for 75 cents on the dollar right now, I'd be cool with that. Um, it's clear that Prescott likes working over the middle. He likes a, sh a short dink, the dink off passes. Cole Beasley, Jason Witten. Jason Witten looks like a fucking steal right now with Prescott. He saw, I think, he almost caught 10 balls yesterday. Caught nine, but a uh, huge PPR game for him. Witten looks like a strong, strong tight end moving forward with Pres Prescott under center. And you have the G-Man side of the ball. We saw we we saw a little salsa action. You know, yo, salute to you, Victor Cruz. The dude has worked so damn hard to get back on the field, and he got back in the end zone yesterday. Good for him, for real. Good dude. I'm happy. NJ Native, what's up? 
And we also saw the rookie Sterling Shepard get in the end zone. Unfortunately for a lot of you top picks, we didn't see OBJ get in. Those games will come. Don't worry about it. Um, that wide receiver trio could be deadly. Um, other than that, we saw a decently even split between Jennings and Vereen. Vereen, obviously, the better PPR play. Jennings kind of makes me nervous. I don't, I don't see a lot of big games coming from him unless the script goes his way. So for me, he's more of an RB3 flex, maybe low end RB2. So um, I love Shepard going forward. Um, I think he can legitimately put up wide receiver three numbers. And uh, after seeing what I saw yesterday, Cruz looked pretty damn good too. He's someone I would pick up and stash in deeper leagues. And let's move on to arguably one of the games of the week, the Pats and the Cardinals. Now, I know a lot of y'all probably hate me because I was on the Martellus Bennett bandwagon and I was like, yep, Gronk's out, fire the boy up. You know what? I can explain myself. This is why I think Bennett had such a shitty game. One, the Patriots were out, were without like two or three of their offensive linemen. And they have this quarterback who hasn't played any games yet. You need extra guys in there to block. Martellus Bennett was blocking on like 80% of his plays. They needed him in there. He's a good blocking tight end. They were down linemen, so they needed him to stay in there. When he was running routes, he had Tyron Matthew come up and guard him a lot of the time. So it's a very tough matchup. I wish they had played someone that wasn't, you know, such a good defense because it was hard for him to make any plays happen. I'll hold that L. I will hold the shit out of that L. I think there are better days coming for Martellus Bennett, and I'm definitely, for me, I'm not dropping him. If you guys want to, you can go ahead, but at the end of the season, when I said I told you so, don't be fucking mad. Otherwise, we saw Hogan get some action, Mitchell get some action. Hard to say any of those guys are anything more than, you know, wide receiver fours. I like Hogan more. I think he's going to keep producing in that offense because, you know, they like those random white receivers, man. They do the thing. Edelman got a ton of looks, obviously. And on the Cardinals side of the ball, Palmer did not look good. Neither did any of their receivers, except for your boy Larry Fitz. Great fucking game from the kid. Um, the problem is, you know, next week that'll be Michael Floyd. The week after that, that'll be John Brown. Week after that, I don't, I don't know where I'm going with that, but David Johnson looked fucking amazing as the workhorse there. So I'm thrilled with him if I if I took him in the first round. Uh, I do think the Cardinals will start off slow, but they'll they'll pick up and all the wide receivers are still producing. I liked what I saw to Michael Floyd, so I'm happy I have him on my bench. I guess we should talk about the Patriots running back situation as well. We uh, saw LeGarrette Brunt. <clears throat> LeGarrette Brunch. This fat motherfucker. LeGarrette Blunt. Got a nice bell cow workload. 22 carries, 70 yards, and a touchdown. James White cost, caught five Passes for 40 yards. Garrett Blunt had almost double the amount of snaps that James White had. It's not something really unexpected. Uh, but, you know, those are the kind of games that you're going to get out of White. The 5 for 40, maybe 4 for 50, something like that. It's just the touchdowns will probably be scarce, so it's, it's really hard to start him in anything except the full PPR because the game, you know, you don't know if the touchdown's coming here, if it's coming in two games or something like that. So it's tough to play. I am definitely rising on Blunt and I was prior to this game starting because we have to think that, you know, with Garoppolo under center, not that he can't handle it, but they're going to try to control the tempo. They're going to keep their defense off the team, off the field for as long as they can. They're going to try to ground and pound, you know, so that uh, it takes a lot of pressure off Garoppolo, so something like 20 carries a game is definitely not outlandish for, for Blunt going forward. And he's looked good. He's looked leaner. He's looked quicker. He's able to make these cuts, you know, a little shake and bake action. So he's looked good. Always the goal line back there, obviously. So that, that was definitely good to see. Uh, and that's a tough matchup against the Cardinals. So as the as the matchups get a little easier for them, uh, Blunt should have a really significant role in this offense and should really produce from a fantasy perspective. Let's move to the Monday night foosball games. They always got that double header. First was kicked off by the Steelers in the skins in which we saw the Steelers shellac Washington. Uh, nothing much to say here. D. Will did his thing. Antonio Brown business is always booming for him. A lot of good stuff all around for the Steelers. A big takeaway from the receivers there would be Eli Rogers. Just everything over the middle. Um, he, he caught, I think, five balls, five or six balls for around 60 yards on seven targets. Uh, so he's going to be pretty heavily used in this in this offense that passes the ball a ton and that scores a lot. So he he's a he's definitely a PPR guy I'm keeping my eye on. 
Uh, and then you had Jesse James, who had seven targets. I don't like him. I wouldn't play him, but it's just good to know that, you know, Roethlisberger's looking over the middle of the field a lot, and he's going to be utilizing those guys like Eli Rogers who are in the slot. And you have the skins. Kirk Cousins looks like ass cheeks. Uh, I'm not going to write him off yet. You know, you got to give, give the man some time. Uh, but other than that, so did Matt Jones. Looked terrible. I think I, I put no stock into him. He got as many carries as running backs would allow there. Chris Thompson looked way better than him, and I wouldn't be surprised if Rob Kelly got a little bit of action next week uh, because Matt Jones is so ineffective. D. Jackson is thing. He's the wide receiver one there, as I told y'all. Um, glad I picked him on most of my teams. He went over Hundo on six catches, I think it was. So he looked super good, as did Jordan Reed. Uh, the yardage and touchdowns weren't there, but they'll come in time as long as he gets those targets. And last up, we have the Rams versus 49ers. God, I stayed up to watch like, I stayed up to watch the game. I ended up falling asleep. I don't remember if it was halftime or it was like midway through the third quarter because I was like, you know what? Seeing my fantasy score is literally not worth the pain of watching this fucking game. I was like, someone like tweeted a picture today and it was like, this is almost unreal. And they showed the charts, like the uh, a chart of the drives at one point. It was 10 straight drives between both the teams, whereas three and out, three and out, three and out, three and out, three and out for 10 straight drives. I'm like, gee, is this even fucking football? Like, what are you doing? I think a big takeaway here is one, obviously the Rams are fucking terrible. doesn't matter how good their defense is. It's not going to help them on offense. I'm a little nervous as a girly owner, but uh, this was the same situation they were last year and Gurley did his thing, but it was always against a very bad defense where he, where he had the, those breakout games. His first four games, he was averaging like 6.7 yards a carry. And then his last nine games, including yesterday's, he's at like 3.6 or something like that. Like it's complete reversal. I do think you can't play any fucking worse than Case Keenum played yesterday. So Goff will eventually get in at quarterback. I don't care that they say he's not ready, that he's third string. He'll be in there sooner rather than later. And I actually think that's good for Gurley. I think that will... Uh, you know, at least defenses will have to prepare for Goff because it, in Keenum, they know what they're getting. They're like, okay, this guy sucks, so we don't have to worry about him. We only have to worry about Gurley. But in Goff, you know, they're saying, hey, this guy could be talented. He's the number one pick. We do have to respect the pass game until he proves us otherwise. So I think that'll be good for Gurley. I'm not worrying yet. I hit the panic button just yet. From the 49ers' point of view, uh, I still want no part of that passing game. But all the reports about Carlos Hyde losing weight this offseason, he's down to like 220 pounds. You could clearly see it. He looked smaller he, in a good way. He looked lean. He looked super fucking quick, finishing his run still, evading players. Man, I would love to see Carlos Hyde play in an offense that was not the 49ers offense. Like put him, oh man, put it, I don't know. Just put him on an offense that could, that's good. And this dude would probably be like a top five running back in the NFL. Dude, he looked that good yesterday. It was almost like Eddie Lacy via... 20, when is his big year? 20, yeah, 2014, but quicker, you know, like better. So, I, I mean, I, I can only imagine what this dude would do in a good offense. But I'm, I'm happy if I'm, a, if I'm a hide owner, for sure. I guess the other takeaway here is Jeremy Curley. He's, he's someone to look for in PPR plays. He caught a bunch of balls, and it looked like he was, you know, continually targeted over the slot, and there's no one else on that offense catching anything. So, he's the only someone I would look at in a deeper, deeper league, but... You know, it's worth noting, I guess, to keep an eye on. So, that'll wrap up the week one recaps. Wrap, wrap up the recaps. I'm sorry I didn't get too in-depth to them. They'll, you know, those those take so long if I go through every game and every team and every player and shit like that. So, I just wanted to put bullet points out there. Um, uh, now, here are some of the top waiver wire pickups of the week. We'll start at quarterback. As I said, Joe Flacco coming off a decently strong game. No, no interceptions. Got in the end zone, 200 something yards. Now he gets to go up against a Cleveland defense that was shredded by Carson Wentz. So you know, I, I think Flacco's definitely got some appeal. If if you were someone who had Tyrod as your quarterback, I would drop him and look for for Joe Flacco. I also like. Jimmy Garoppolo was probably on the wire. They get to go up against uh, Miami. Definitely improved. Uh, improved defense a little bit. Looked pretty good against the Seahawks, although they have a terrible offensive line. I think Garoppolo's going to have a lot more confidence after, you know, getting that week one victory, looking good out there, throwing some good balls. He can pick on the weak secondary of Miami, which was awful last year. Um, so I like Garoppolo as another quarterback that you could look to play this week. Now, I don't want to get crazy and go and have this run its course, but 
even Dak Prescott's on a terrible play. He didn't look great, obviously, from a passing perspective. But I do think the Giants' defense is actually underrated, and they're pretty good, and we'll probably realize that about six weeks into the season. Uh, now they get the Redskins, who were torched last night by the Steelers. They have good cornerback play, but that's about it over there. So I think Dak could put up some good numbers, considering he likes to use the middle of the field and doesn't really, you know, he's not going to be targeting Josh Norman a ton. Running back, a lot of the top plays are these guys who, you know, catch the ball and it's becoming more and more and more of a theme you know as fantasy goes year to year you have Theo Riddick who I touched on look great he's going to get a ton of balls in that offense they throw the ball a ton their defense isn't good so they're going to let up points and they're going to be you know using that dink and dunk offense so Theo Riddick should honestly get like five to six catches per game great PPR play uh, next up we have Tevin Coleman obviously probably might not be on the wire but um, if he is, I'd go grab him, considering he's going to be in a 50-50 split with Devonta Freeman, and you never know how that's going to end up working out. He has appeal on his own now, which is something he didn't really have before the season started. He could put up value by himself. Then you have, sticking in the NFC South, Charles Sims, who also looked good yesterday. Um, not a ton of value by himself, but uh, James Winston is going to continue throwing the ball a lot, and Charles Sims is a great pass pass catching back so I think he's someone to definitely target if he's on the waiver wire and lastly Chavaris Cadet as I mentioned before he had seven targets in that Saints offense so uh, I'm not sure if he's gonna hit seven every time but I mean seven for a running back can easily turn into 65 yards and a touchdown on a good day so deeper leagues deeper PPR leagues you gotta go Chavaris Cadet there wide receivers uh yeah this was a big injury week in Keenan Allen, Sammy Watkins, some other guys. So I'm just going to list off a bunch of names here. Tajay Sharp, you got to get on. Will Fuller, you got to get on. Chris Hogan, um, I guess Tyrell Williams out in San Diego. Philip Dorsett in Indy. Michael Thomas in New Orleans. And Kenny Stills, if Devonta Parker is out. Kenny Stills is still strong. I know he dropped that, but people would be super high on him if he had just caught that and ran into the end zone like a non-retard. Tight ends, I'm going to go tell you to pick up Virgil Green again. Would have had a big week if Trevor Simeon just had lobbed that ball over the defender because he's wide open in the end zone. So Virgil Green is a guy. Eric Ebron, not a guy I was high on coming into the season, but he looked good yesterday or two days ago. Uh, Stafford throwing him the ball. Uh, he got in the end zone, caught like five balls, I think, maybe 55 yards, something around there. Sorry I've never had these stats on point. It's just too much to remember. And I'm not like on a podcast where I can have all these notes in front of me. Otherwise, I'll look crazy. Uh, so these are mostly just off the top of my head. They're in the ballpark, so don't worry about it. Uh, Ebron looked good, so he's probably on the wire as a guy that I would play over a ton of guys that are probably being played right now, including Fleener, uh, probably Martellus Bennett at this point, and a couple others. So yeah, those are two tight ends I definitely like. Defenses. The New York Jets. They had seven sacks against Cincy, and Cincy has a good O-line. Imagine what they're going to do at Buffalo on short week. Buffalo just had their top offensive lineman tweak his ankle for the second time in the last month. He's probably going to be out Thursday night. They already have zero offense. Who knows if Sammy Watkins is going to play. The Jets should absolutely swarm Buffalo, put up a huge game defensively. I also like Detroit against Tennessee. I don't like Detroit's defense, but I like playing against Tennessee, who just let the Vikings absolutely dominate them. Uh, the Vikings put up like 23 fantasy points, so Detroit can easily put up, you know, 10. 10 to 11, that's a solid start for fantasy. All right, so that wraps it up. That was super long and that was honestly kind of annoying to film. You know, if you guys like it, if you guys want me to do something different than just these like stupid little recaps I run through and stuff and you know, the waiver wire pickups at the end, let me know because I'd probably rather do it a different way. But um, these take long to film, they take long to edit and they're just long overall. I don't know if y'all even want to watch these that are so long. So just let me know, you know, if you liked the video, thumbs up. If you didn't like it, still give me that thumbs up. I don't give a shit. Go subscribe. Tell your friends. Tell your mom. Tell your kids. Tell your dogs, parents, uncles, sister about me. The one who makes the good meat sauce. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Maria. Tell them all about it. Thank you, as always. Go follow us on Twitter. BDGE underscore fantasy FB. If you got some sit start questions, as always, hit me on Twitter. Hit me on youtube just leave a comment below or something like that i'll get back to you eventually hopefully if i don't get back to you after a few days just comment again and i'll i'll eventually follow up it's getting a little harder as more and more people you know subscribe and follow me but you know i try to stay loyal to y'all because y'all are loyal to me and i thank you so much for it peace